Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webcast brought to you by GEMS. I'm AJ Heitman, Editor Emeritus of GEMS, and I'm really happy to uh, be the uh, opening for the today's event, Systems of Care That Scale, How EMS Leaders Are Building the Future. You're really going to enjoy it. We have a faculty of four today. We have James Seek. He's Assistant Chief of Clinical Services at Montgomery County Hospital District in Texas. And we have Dr. Uh, Robert Dixon. He's the EMS Medical Director at Montgomery County Hospital District. Kevin Crocker is the Division Chief of Quality and Process Improvement at Montgomery County Hospital District. And our moderator for today is Josh Jordan. Josh is a former flight paramedic firefighter, and he's currently the customer service manager for the Southern United States at Pulsera. Um, this event is sponsored by Pulsera. It's gonna show you all of the intricacies of uh, Pulsera. And I really think Pulsera is one of the most epic things that has come across EMS in the last two decades. It's a mobile uh, and browser-based telehealth and communication platform that connects teams across organizations. And that's really important. What makes it unique is its ability to enable dynamic network communications for any patient event. Uh, with the Pulsera uh, software, clinicians can add a new organization, team, or individual to any encounter, uh, dynamically building a care team, even as the patient condition and location are constantly evolving. And in today's world, uh, that's really important because it's all about time. Uh, you simply create a dedicated patient channel, you build a team, you communicate using audio, live video, instant messaging, data, images, and key benchmarks. Now, I think the key here is studies report an average decreased treatment time of approximately 30% when using Pulsera. So it really does cut time because of its efficiency. It's the evidence-based standard of care. And of course, you can get more information at www.pulsera.com. I'd like to start off with a really uh, intense, quick video that shows the Pulsera system in action. And then we'll begin our dialogue with the uh, webcast. So we're gonna roll the video right now. Call us the address of the emergency. Getting the help on the way to you now, but I have some instructions for you, okay? Hi, sir. My name is Rainy. I'm with MCHD. What's your name? George. George. What's going on today? Oh, no. Just weak and feel nauseated and numb on my right side. Can you show me your teeth smile? Okay. Can you raise up both your arms? You can't raise that no. one. Go ahead. Squeeze my fingers. Can you squeeze with this one at all? No. Um, what hospital preference do y'all have? Memorial Park. Okay, so he's having symptoms of a stroke. I'm gonna go ahead and activate the team at Memorial Hermit so that they're ready. Did you see the stroke? Yeah, yeah, it looks like it's a true stroke. Why don't we go ahead and activate it and just let me know when it gets through. Okay. okay. One, two, three. Okay. There you go. Alright, going up.
Thank you, everybody. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our dynamic moderator for today's event, Josh Jordan. Thank you, AJ, for the introduction. Excited to be here today to help tell the story about the great things that uh, MCHD is doing. Uh, we have a great topic today. Let's jump right on in. 2021 is finding us uh, all in, a, in recovery mode. Uh, lessons from 2020 are numerous, but the most important is to have resilient systems that are flexible, adaptable, and scale with system needs. We connected with uh, MCHD EMS prior to the 2020 pandemic as partner in the EMS system. As AJ mentioned, our panelists today from MCHD EMS are EMS Medical Director, Dr. Rob Dixon, Division Chief of Quality and Process Improvement, Kevin Crocker, and Division Chief of Clinical Services, James C. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Now, Dr. Dixon, you have a really special relationship with systems of care at this scale. Tell us about it. I do. I was fortunate enough to work with a very talented group of physicians uh, in East Texas, uh, a private group at a mercy, busy, busy level two trauma center, stroke center, uh, STEMI center. Uh, so uh, quite busy, very, very talented group. And the group leaders put together a meeting. It was a, called a consenta certa. I'm probably not doing that justice, Josh, but uh, it, it basically means kind of a meeting of the minds. And so we had this, uh, this dinner put together of all the partners, uh, had some steaks and wine, and everybody in the group was tasked with bringing an idea. So you had to bring and pitch an idea. Everybody got 10 minutes. We went around the table and everybody pitched their idea, and the, the idea had to be something to improve our patient care or improve our, our practice of medicine. And the idea that came out of that was what everyone now knows as Pulsera, and that doctor was Dr. James Woodson, was the founder. So that's how I became involved in it. I've been a, a longtime friend and, and partner of James uh, and have done all the peer-reviewed research. I've authored multiple articles, including some of the ones that AJ talked about. Wow. Uh, that's uh, that's impressive. Uh, it's been a it's been a, a joy actually to work with you as well, um, and, and your work with with Pulsera. But um, let's dive right in, um, <laughs> Chief Crocker. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, MCHD and the, and the system. Sure. So MCHD or Montgomery County Hospital District. Uh, so we're the sole 911 provider for Montgomery County, Texas. So Montgomery County is the county due north of Harris County, which is where Houston is located. Uh, so we share a border with, with Harris County, uh, which makes us kind of a suburban community to the city of Houston. Um, about 1,100 square miles total, uh, very geographically diverse. Uh, so we have a lot of suburban areas, obviously, being, being next to a, an urban city like Houston. But we also have lots of rural areas and even some frontier land as well. So when you look at a, a landmass of that size, it's very geographically diverse. Uh, it's a challenge to kind of staff and respond and cover. So uh, when you look at the county as a whole, we have about a population of uh, 600,000 people. Uh, Montgomery County is one of the fastest growing uh, counties in the country. Uh, booming population prior to, to COVID. Um, and I think that will continue you know, post COVID as well. Uh, run about 65,000 uh, calls annually. Uh, that number has steadily increased along with population. So we expect that number to continue growing over the next few years as well. Uh, when you look at our county as a whole, uh, about 1,100 square miles, we, we cover that, we break it up into four different districts or regions. So we have uh, a north, a south, a east, and a west. Uh, have a district chief that covers each region. They're kind of responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of, of that, that area and the units that are assigned to that area. Uh, we staff about 30 ambulances dynamically, so it kind of ebbs and flows depending on time of day and need. Um, so kind of a mix of 24 hour trucks and peak trucks to, to manage that volume. And then, uh, when you look at our, our healthcare system as a whole, uh, being next to Houston is a, is a blessing. So Houston has the Texas medical center, which is the largest medical center in the world, uh, and really doing some innovative medicine and care, uh, for the people they see there and being so close to it, we actually have, uh, pretty much a representative hospital or, you know, a satellite hospital of each one of those systems that are in the med center here in our county as well. Um, so we have about six hospitals we transport to routinely, uh, and that's where we get most of our, our STEMI, our stroke, and our trauma care. So all of our time sensitive uh, emergencies can be handled here in the county. Uh, we have comprehensive stroke centers, level two stroke centers, 
So pretty much any kind of acute event that we respond to, we have a hospital in our county that can, can take care of that patient. Um, in addition to the hospital partners, we also use some freestanding EDs. So we have a, a list of routine freestanding EDs we transport to, which is kind of a mix of both hospital owned and independent owned. And we also have standalone psychiatric facilities we can transport patients to, uh, to get those, those mental health patients in the, the right place without having to go to the hospital. So that's kind of a, a quick overview of, of who we are and what we do and what the system looks like. That's excellent, Chief Crocker. Thanks for that. Uh, bringing in Dr. Dixon, uh, could you share with us kind of how all this started with MCHD? How did you guys get going with this? Sure, Josh. It really came came to life. Uh, when I came here, uh, it was right at the time that the 2014-2015 uh, large artery occlusion papers showing all the efficacy in thrombectomy and stroke. Um, and so we really worked hard in our system, not only in stroke, but in STEMI and trauma in developing those systems of care. So for large artery occlusion, we had to come up with a new stroke scale. We had to do all kinds of intensive training and really build partnerships with our, our first responders, which is a, a vast uh, organization. We work with 11 different fire departments up here with uh, over 1,100 members. Our hospital systems, as Kevin said, we have six major receiving hospitals. And uh, at this point, now four of them are comprehensive stroke centers. So trying to build this big system of care. And then Memorial Hermann, which is one of the major health centers uh, here in the region, adopted the Pulsera platform. So we thought it fit really nicely in with our mission mm -hmm. to improve care in time-sensitive emergencies, which is kind of where I saw it going. Mm -hmm. um, and if we talk about where the platform has really gone, I think we need to talk about it in, in four different distinct time frames. I just spoke of the kind of pre-COVID, uh, and then you have to go to the COVID pandemic. Like they they got the the app, the platform. Chief Seek uh, was our lead to help them, you know, get this thing integrated. And we thought that's great. We're going to follow our STEMI times, our stroke times. We're really going to we're going to dial this in, and then COVID hit. Uh, and so you really got to talk about it in four different time frames. So it's, it's pre-COVID, which is why I just described. I'll let Chief Seek talk a little bit more in a sec. Uh, COVID operations, uh, the winter storm, the Valentine's Day, the five-day storm of 2021, uh, and then kind of what we're looking for for the future. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Chief Seek and let him talk about kind of pre-COVID and, and how, you, how you brought in the app or with the hospital system and, and what else we used it for. Yeah, COVID really changed our our focus on how we use the technology because our practice changed. All of a sudden, you know, we're we're isolated from our providers in the field, which we have about 250 of, and you know, we we don't we, we can't do in person training anymore because of COVID, and our uh, practice was changing. You know, we were no longer going to use nebulizers. We were putting viral filters on ET tubes. We paused our non invasive, uh, and we were very conscious on our resources as of everyone. And we felt like a safe way for us to uh, use our resources appropriately and reduce risk for the providers and for the uh, hospital providers and everyone was to, we come with an alternate disposition plan. And we have MedCom uh, and just a little background on MedCom. We've used it for years. And what MedCom is, uh, our definition of MedCom and how we use it here is we'll take a, a couple chiefs and we'll put them in the alarm office and from there, they'll be able to do a play-by-play -play analysis of how we use our resources to make sure that we're using our resources appropriate and efficient as we can. So we kind of morphed that in and we used the technology because, I mean, we had to get innovative and just bring all of our resources in as, as we could. So what, what we did is we added two squads, and they were going to be non-emergency response. We were just going to those low-level Priority three responses, non-emergency in our part that were uh, triage to the dispatch center. We were going to uh, send those there. And from there, we used a Pulsera. What we did is we made all of our chiefs a destination. And what that allowed was is that allowed our field staff and and for those medics on the squad to do uh, video to video uh, consults to determine whether, hey, you know, so we would just be in agreement, this patient doesn't need to go to the hospital, we can leave them there. And that's what we did. And we had success. Uh, there was some, you know, early on, there was a fear of COVID, you know, just not a lot known about it. So a lot of that low line uh, fruit as, you know, uh, you know, young COVID, just a cough, a little bit of fever, none of that. We were able to just consult. We, you know, we'd educate them, you know, make sure you take your towel off, make sure you hydrate. And then we were able to leave them at home.
And then I think uh, probably another very powerful way we use it was we did employee monitoring through the uh, Pulsar app. And I'll let Chief Crocker expand on that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, think back to early COVID, you know, March, mm -hmm. April, May, like there was a lot of unknown with COVID uh, and what the effects were going to be on our providers or our, our community or their families. Um, and, you know, our, our number one job here is to take care of our employees, right, to make sure we have a a safe, healthy workforce. Uh, so we thought the best way for us to kind of approach COVID and COVID infections within our employees uh, was to develop what we call the Employee Health Monitoring Program. Uh, and that was a program we established to kind of monitor our COVID positive employees or COVID positive employees, family members, or employees who had high risk COVID exposures. And basically what we did there is we set up a, a program where we did daily symptoms checks, where they would log their, their symptoms and their temperature. Uh, but probably more importantly is we had a dedicated uh, person from our command team who was the point of contact to monitor the employee's health. So they would reach out every day uh, via phone call or via text message just to check on the employee and see how they were doing, uh, see how they were feeling, see how their symptoms were, uh, how their family was, or if they had any resource needs. Um, and the way we kind of tied uh, Pulse Air into that is we use the uh, Pulse Air patient platform um, to connect our, our employees who were sick or had progressing system, uh, symptoms or were just worried about how they were feeling with one of our medical directors. So we are very blessed here to have two wonderful medical directors who are engaged and care about their employees' um, health and well-being. Uh, so Dr. Dixon and Dr. Patrick kind of volunteered to step up uh, to be a point of contact 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, no matter what the, the need was or how big or how small, uh, we could connect our employees with one of them via Pulse Air patient so they could do a face-to-face -face visit with the employee. And you know, for, for our employees who are home and isolated, um, you know, with an unknown disease and unknown outcome, especially very early on, uh, having that resource of a familiar face, uh, a medical expert that you trust, that you can talk to and uh, bounce questions or ideas or thoughts off of was an extremely valuable resource for our employees. Uh, what was your perspective from the physician side of that? Yeah, thanks, Chief. I think that that's, I paid him to say how great we were, <laughs> by the way. Uh, no, I mean, that, I, I think it was incredibly powerful. Um, as Chief Seek said, I mean, that was a, those were pretty heady times, right? Early on, we didn't know what was going to happen, and we were all, across the nation, across the world, struggling with with procedures of PPE and how we looked after our employees the best. Uh, and I think I speak for Dr. Patrick as well. To, to me, it was very satisfying uh, professionally and personally to be able to connect with our employees and our families. So to be able to uh, look after the people who actually look after our patients is incredibly important and, and powerful to both of us. So uh, I, I thought that the platform uh, really fit into there. I never saw it being used for that. I mean, it's like we got it for one thing and ended up using it for another, but I thought that was a pretty powerful use for it. Yeah. That really is a, a great testament of how you guys were able to leverage the, the many tools and the, and the aspects of, of Pulsera uh, to enable those flexible interactions that you needed uh, almost on the spot uh, and, and was able to expand that and contract it as you needed to. So. Uh, that's uh, that's impressive that you guys were able to uh, to, to do that during that, that time period. So uh, let's move on to Valentine's Day 2021 Winter Storm, Chief Crocker. Uh, what can you tell us about that one? I don't want to go back. Oh, okay. come on. <laughs> I don't want to do that again. Um, so Valentine's Day 2021. Um, so we live in Southeast Texas. So Southeast Texas is not a cold location. We're generally hot and muggy, like that's the weather you get here with lots of rain, um, and we're accustomed to that. We're accustomed to the heat, we're accustomed to the rain, we're accustomed to tropical storms and flooding. Like we always encounter, you know, a couple flood events, flood events a year, uh, and a tropical storm, hurricane, every year, every other year. Like it's a, a pretty common occurrence that we uh, have unfortunately become pretty good at responding to those types of disasters. Um, something we're not accustomed to is cold weather and snow. Um, so when you go back to February of this year, uh, it got really, really cold. So single digits, which is uh, almost unheard of here in this, in this area, and it snowed, um, which is very outside the norm. Uh, and we don't really have a disaster response plan built for that. 
uh, we were able to use kind of some of our lessons learned from flooding and hurricanes and, you know, apply them to this event. But, I mean, to summarize the, the event in, you know, a sentence or two, it got really, really cold. Um, it snowed. The ice is, I mean, the roads iced over, which made it hard to respond. The power went out um, pretty much across the county. There was some pockets that still had power, but it was out pretty much across the county. Um, and then once it did start to warm up a little bit, the pipes started bursting. Uh, the houses here are insulated for heat, not cold. Um, so we had lots of uh, burst pipe issues and flooding inside a home. So really it was a, a disaster after disaster after disaster of different types of things we were having to deal with and broach over that five day period. And it was a very long five days. It was incredible. It was. Incredible. I mean, the, the volume doubled yep. and uh, our ability to respond was lessened. So we, yeah. we really had to come up with some stuff on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we did. And we actually, we brought in our staff 12 hours early, I think. Uh, so we'd have plenty of staffing. And then I want to say either 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. We went to our disaster response on Valentine's Day morning. What that did is once again, we, uh, we rallied up MedCom. Uh, we got some very, we got some very talented chiefs that we put up there along with Doc, and we started. We we turned off our auto dispatch and we started uh, triaging all of our priority three calls and decided, hey, do we need to send an ambulance now, or can this wait a day? Can this wait an hour? You know, just just whatever. And then along with that, you know, once again, we relied on alternate disposition as well. You know, with the Pulsar platform, our chiefs were able to communicate with our field crews and the patient in real time. They had all the vital signs there. I mean, they had all the information that they needed and we were able to leave some of those patients at home. And then there was another, there was another cohort of patients that I didn't think about was all these post-op patients that we were, you know, that we were calling, you know, and a lot of them, you know, they're saying, hey, I'm supposed to go to my doctor today. I don't know anything about my wound. I'm scared. So through there, we were able to do the pulse of a patient with doc. And we were able to look at those wounds and say, no, I mean, I think you're good to stay home. This looks good. Yeah, I thought mm -hmm. it was great. Yeah. I mean, we, we were able to manage a, a fair amount of patients. And the, I think the good thing, one of the, the things that we loved is it n never started off to be like that, but it also keeps a record of all these people, yeah. right? So sure. before in our previous disasters, mm -hmm. and we had MedCom way before we had this platform and and we would keep a spreadsheet of all the people who hadn't been rescued that we had pending that that we had that one the team had made contact with we had clinical interaction with uh and we just kept it on an excel spreadsheet so we would a little visual reminder a record of the of the encounter but a visual reminder to call that patient back and then now we just used the platform and it made it easy uh there was an asthma patient. There was a couple of a couple of different patients that we managed at home where you know, we had the crews uh, uh, give some uh, steroids, uh, give an inhale, an MDI beta agonist, um, you know, do a good exam and assessment on. And we left those patients down, down the road, actually, at another family member's home where they had power and they could use their nebulizer. And then we just checked back with them. And there was many kind of patients like that that weren't sick enough to go to the hospital, but they were kind of in that tweener grad. You didn't want to say, well, just stay home and take some Tylenol and call us back if you mm -hmm. get worse. There were some that we kind of followed along and, and that's where we got their phone number to use the Pulsara patient for that. Because this was right here in the surge of COVID. I mean, this is when we were yeah. seeing our highest number. So we were able to clear quite a few young COVID patients that, you know, they were just unsure, they were stuck at home, so. Yeah, and that resource saving was so vitally mm -hmm. important for us. Um, like you mentioned, we had double our call volumes. We had twice as many responses to, to, to answer. Uh, two of our hospital partners yeah. were on a yeah. total disaster <laughs> from water leak. Yeah. So six of the main hospitals, two of them went down. So we reduced mm -hmm. the amount of destination to transport patients to. Um, so using Pulsera and MedCom to kind of divert some of those mm -hmm. patients, either leaving them at home or getting them to warming shelters or uh, not even sending a, an ambulance at all sometimes if, yeah. if Doc could uh, see the patient was such a resource savings for us. And it was really a, a huge saving for us. Chief, so, you want to talk about, you brought warming centers. Do you want to just touch on that, Chief, and, yeah. and talk about uh, Homeland Security and our, our process here and then what MCHD's contribution was to the war. I thought the warming centers were vital. I mean, that was a big problem. We have a lot of medically fragile people here, don't necessarily, didn't need transport to a, an acute care hospital, 
but they don't do, you know, your medics out there, right? They don't do well. If you have COPD and diabetes and are elderly, you don't do well when it's, you know, 30 degrees or 20 degrees out and you don't have your nebulizer, you know, you don't have access to your dialysis, all these other things. Yeah, so our uh, our Office of Emergency Management is kind of responsible, responsible for shoulder setups in the county for disasters. And like I said, we're kind of used to shoulder setup for for uh, tropical storms or flood events, but not uh, cold events. So they kind of pivoted from their traditional shoulder setup and created warming centers. So there's some pre-established places in the county that we do use as shelters on a routine basis uh, we, that do have power or have generator power. Um, and it was a place for people to go who were cold or who was dis displaced from their home because of uh, busted pipes or flooding. Um, and we use those warming centers as kind of a safe place to go. Uh, we do have kind of a medically frail community here, like you mentioned, uh, and a lot of times shelters won't take those medically frail people who need oxygen or have, have medical needs that require some type of medical assistance. Uh, so we kind of rallied up and, um, and helped out with the, the warming shelters by staffing the warming shelters with our community paramedics or some of our uh, field paramedics who were on their downtime uh, to be in the warming centers to provide some of those you know, daily daily care needs or some mm -hmm. of the medically frail people uh, to kind of keep an eye on them to make sure they were doing okay. Um, and we use that as an opportunity to, to keep people from having to go to the hospital or to one of the freestanding EDs. Uh, and really kudos to our staff, like our staff over the winter storm and in, in, in whole those five days, they worked harder than we've ever asked them to work. Uh, and they did it uh, with a smile on their face. Uh, they stepped up and worked additional shifts, staffing the warming shelters, and just uh, kudos to the staff in general for, for what they did. But uh, it was a really a good opportunity for our, our program here to kind of step up and help the community when it was in need. Yeah, it was really the first time we've had a disaster yeah. in the middle of a disaster, yeah. right? As, as mm -hmm. Chief C said, I mean, we, this building holds, that we're sitting in now holds, you know, 100 people on a regular day. And, you know, we were right in the, in the heat of the, the biggest surge of COVID we'd seen in the region. And the whole, the command staff, the incident command was, had been spooled up for quite some time at that point, uh, and is, you know, 12 people in this entire building. Uh, so it, it was incredible to have this to prepare, still being actively responding in, to one crisis and have the chiefs and the staff completely do a 180 and meet these new challenges. So uh, hats off to, to all of our staff. It was yeah. Just incredible. Sounds like you incredible. had multiple agencies kind of working together. I mean, you talked about uh, uh, emergency management setting up the tents. You talked about community paramedicine going out. You talked about fire departments, and you talked about your local hospitals and and the the stress that it put on those guys. Um, it, it's 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 not very often that we get that many people involved, especially in a, in a big disaster, and being able to communicate and and uh, have those flexible interactions to, to be able to to bend the platform to do what you needed to do. So. Absolutely. Um, all right, guys, uh, let's, uh, let's do a little round table here. And, uh, uh, Dr. Dixon, you actually mentioned earlier, um, you know, uh, we talked about the four phases. We're kind of on fourth phase now, and it's about the future. Um, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll, uh, we'll go to Chief Crocker. Uh, let's, uh, let's spend a little time here, Chief. Uh, tell me what's, uh, what, what in your mind, what's the future in your mind? Uh, stop talking about COVID. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Although we're in a bit of a surge, so I think yeah. we're talking about that again, yeah. but uh, we'll get away from that. We are talking bit. about it a bit this week. Yeah. Um, so MCHD is actually a uh, model participant for the ET3 program. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's a Medicare initiative to kind of uh, use treatment place uh, in the home or alternative uh, destinations to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, so we are a, a participant in that program. Um, I think when you look at the future of EMS, um, platforms such as Pulse Air or other telehealth platforms play such a vital role in where we are going as a profession. Um, so using, you know, a you know, a technology platform in the patient's home to connect them with the right resource at the right time is so vitally important. And using, using telehealth, like you can connect them to an ED physician or a psychiatrist or um, I'm at a loss of words. So, <laughs> um, you know, connecting them with the right person and the right resource in the moment and getting them the care they need when they need it is so vitally important. Um, 
So I know there are some fire departments, some police departments around the country that have started using Pulse Era for uh, mental health evaluation, right? So a lot of times, you know, mental health or law enforcement partners uh, respond to mental health patients uh, without us there or sometimes with us there. Um, and they're complicated, right? Mental health is a, is a disease that's uh, growing in this country. Uh, and there's not a lot of resources dedicated to that, to that need. Um, and taking those mental health patients to the ED to get medical clearance isn't always the right answer. It's not always what's best for them. So I know some of them are using Pulse Air to connect the law enforcement officers on scene with the mental health patient to a physician to do kind of a medical screening or medical evaluation um, and coming up with an alternate plan for that patient. Uh, and then sometimes tying in the psychiatrist or a therapist um, to evaluate the patient in the moment and make a plan for what that patient, um, what the best plan for that patient is. And oftentimes getting them direct placement to a psychiatric facility. Um, I don't know how it is around the country, but here in the in the Houston market, it's not uncommon to get you know, mental health patients who are in an ED, uh, stuck in the ED four or five days waiting for placement to a psychiatric facility, which is not good for the hospital. Uh, resources are limited, uh, at least in this region, with COVID and bed space and staffing. So tying up a precious ED bed for a psychiatric cold isn't good for the hospital. But more importantly, patient-centered is not good for that patient either. That patient is not receiving the care they need for the crisis they're currently in in the emergency department. They're, they're better suited in a psychiatric facility. So if you can use technology to assess the patient and get them to the right place the first time, that's a win for the entire system. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, agree. yeah absolutely. That that first step uh, from the scene, you know, that that uh, that making that right first step determines the next seventy-two to ninety-six hours of what happens with that patient. So, um, you know, what if the patient just didn't have to go into the system? Period, and and, and get that band aid and go back out on the street for us to to, to enable to encounter uh, maybe twenty-four hours down the down the road, yep. uh, back back to square one. Uh, we just kind of band aided it, and, and well, we're going to see it again pretty soon. So. Yeah, you see. I agree. I agree. And to make all this work, ET3 or, you know, or whether it's a critical care consult, I think we need to tie some of these technologies together. You know, Pulsera here, we use the butterfly ultrasound. And right now we use it for our region during resuscitation. Uh, we've been pretty successful with it. Hopefully we'll expand it to, to some other uh, avenues of care soon. But I mean, as of now, if we can tie these technologies together, you know, and I, I can learn a whole team or I can, you know, or I can run some information by doc. Hey, can you give me some, you know, some input real, you know, real, yeah. real fast. We can provide this patient the best care. I think that's where the technology is going. And if we can just integrate some of this, I think it's just going to work. It's, it's going to be seamless, you know, whether it's ET3, critical care, MIH, you know, just, I, I guess the sky's the limit for this technology. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And being being the oldest guy in the room, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the future about going back to the past. So as Chief Crocker said, everybody is is a little bit COVID wary here and around the world uh, that does our kind of work. Uh, I would like to get away from it too and kind of uh, get back to to normal operations and things that we really have a big focus on, which is you know making it making that difference. You know, making the right first step. I think that was a good way to put it, Josh. Um, so we want to, to get back to having an open book and transparency between all the systems in the healthcare system. So, you know, we are in silos. Like one of you guys said earlier, we have the EMS silo, and then we have the hospital silo. Then we have the ED silo and the subspecialist silo and all different types of subspecialists. And if you have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, that goes on and on and on and on. Um, and those doctors, it's going to be a shock to everyone. They don't actually talk to one another very much, right? They don't really communicate. Well. And so I think to have one, one platform that is the, it's the, the one source for the truth, right? So, so I know when the door time is because it got pressed on a button and it, it got marked, right? And I can go back and look at that. And I can, I can tell when the patient went to the cath lab and I can actually even more importantly, and for my crews and myself, I can get the outcome. I can look at the images. I can see what happened to the patient. Um, my son's a paramedic, and uh, he it's really odd that we were having this meeting today and having this webinar, but he called me yesterday, and he said, Dad, I want to run a case by you. I had. He's a fairly new paramedic, and he had to run the other day. It's a, it's a uh, elderly woman 
who was last known well. It's about three o'clock in the morning now, guys, and it was last known well. It's like ten o'clock at night, and normally walkie-talkie, a very functional woman, uh, and her family finds her on the floor. So now it's three o'clock in the morning. They find her on the floor, uh, and so you kind of going through, they're on scene and they're running through their differential, kind of the serial killer for Alter Melstas. So lots of nasty things live in there. So strokes and uh, uh, seizures, post from a seizure and toxins and sepsis and infections, all these types of things uh, are kind of live in there. And so my son and his partner, they're assessing the patient. The patient got normal glucose, uh, is uh, uh, really not arousable, making incoherent words, but mining her own airway. The vital signs were really not terribly abnormal. So it didn't really lead him down a diagnostic pathway. And they talked and said they agreed, you know, hey, this stroke is coming up higher and higher, right? Once you've gotten rid of endocrine and, and all these others, and then they decide to stroke alert, uh, but the patient has fever. And so they find this fever and then they have what we all do, right? We have clinical indecision. So everything's kind of leading us down one pathway. And then we get this one little piece of information that says, well, wait a minute, maybe this is not, you know, a stroke. This is sepsis or this is something else. So they ultimately they decide to go ahead and do the stroke alert and they get to the hospital and, and the, the doctor decides, well, you know, stroke is less high on my differential uh, and, you know, sepsis is over here. So, when we talked about it, he was like, yeah, dad, I put in a, uh, like a request to get the outcome of that page. I said, well, what's the outcome of the patient, son? Did you go to the CT scan? So no, we had to clear and, and get back in service. So I said, well, did you put in a request to, to get that information? And he said, yeah, but you know, sometimes those, those usually don't come back. Yeah. Right. And so I think that that's always been, I have studied, uh, you know, care in time sense of emergencies, really most of my career, um, from the beginning uh, of when I came out of residency. And if you read any of that literature, peer reviewed or non peer reviewed, there's always one sentence in there saying, we've got to do a better job in real time, getting feedback where it counts, which is in the moment, right? So how powerful would that have been to have that feedback immediately going, yep, Austin, it, it was a stroke or it wasn't a stroke, or, you know, here's what we found on the head CT. Right. Instead of two weeks later, three weeks later. So you guys can comment on it. I think as a clinician, as an educator, I think the most powerful uh, feedback we can get is bedside teaching and, and right there on scene or shortly after, not not two weeks or, or three weeks later. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, we learn by trial and error. Right. And I know uh, as far as our part part with Memorial Harmony, if we do a stimmy alert, and I think this is interesting. We bring it in and if it's an activation and it goes all the way through the providers later get a pre when the stent was placed and then after flow of when the stent. And so they love that. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, and you, you learn, you know, I mean, just so taking oh, yeah. pictures within the app of a pre occlusion and then after they cross the lesion so that they're including those pictures for you guys. Yes, sir. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. To, to your point, like as a clinician, how do you know if you made the right decision or not if you never get outcome information back? Um, so using your son as an example, was it a stroke or was it sepsis? And is there things he could have learned from that case that he know the final outcome of the patient right. that would make him a better clinician for the next patient he takes care of? And that outcome loop is something that, that's broken in our in our profession in general. Actually, I read a really good article last week um, talking about burnout and how that played a role in it because you're always at 100, 100 miles an hour and then you hit the doors and it's closed and you're closed out. Like you no longer know any information about that patient. What was the outcome? Were you right? Were you wrong? Are there things that you could have learned from that patient encounter to help with the next patient? Like I, I always think of it like you're flying a plane um, and then you close your eyes as you're going in for a landing, right? You don't know if you actually landed the plane or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, a pilot would never do that, right? But that's kind of what we do every day. We fly the plane, we make clinical decisions for our patients. Uh, we kind of drive their care and then we hit the ER doors and we close our eyes and never know what happened afterwards. Um, and that's not good for our profession. It's not good for our provider. So finding a way to, to close that feedback loop, you know, is good for our employees because or our providers in general, because they will become better clinicians based off that, that information. Yeah. Which impacts the community. Yep. Yeah. I just couldn't agree more about mm -hmm. 
you guys really are blazing a trail in the future, and we're super excited to work with you guys and partner with you guys. Uh, anything we left off? Anything we want to touch on? Shout outs? You call it? You name it. I, I got to give a shout out for uh, Dr. Patrick in the in the podcast. Our associate medical director couldn't be here today, Dr. Casey Patrick. Some of you know him as the the moderator and and uh, kind of the the inventors are actually here. Uh, the clinical team and, and Dr. Patrick with the MCHD Paramedic Podcast, really wide listenership. It's free, open access medical education. Uh, I think it's to the point, 20-minute podcasts on clinic, vast majority clinical clinical topics, but very, very successful, over 100 of them online at wherever you consume your podcasts. Uh, got over half a million listens, Chief. So uh, have a listen. We did a great one uh, with... Uh, Dr. Jarvis and Dr. Vithalani from Fort Worth and Dr. Pickett from Austin. So we did kind of a Texas wrap up of the winter storm. And, and you guys will hear they had some really neat insights there as well. So if you're interested in that, you can find us where you consume all your podcasts. If you have questions about like for us in the group or about the podcast, you can always reach us at any time, uh, either through uh, your connections with GEMS our colleagues at GEMS or Pulsera, or just drop us an email at the podcast email. It's podcast at mchd-tx.org. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent. That's, uh, you, you have something? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just, you know, as communication evolves, you know, I mean, we're getting further and further away from a, a phone call or a radio report, you know, especially as new generations come into EMS, they're accustomed, you know, whether it's whatever social media platform they use, they're accustomed to using their phone to communicate that information, you know, sure. and they're accustomed to adding pictures to it and all that. So I feel like all that ties into the future of VMS, you know, and the use of Pulse Era. Yeah. And this, this probably sounds cliche in the year 2021, but technology is the future. I know we're here, but technology is the future. Um, and everything we talked about today was some type of uh, emergent response, right? Whether that's time sensitive emergencies or, Responding to a disaster, COVID, winter storm, hurricane, insert your you know, flavor du jour of, of disaster, communication is key. So having relationships with your fire department partners and your um, hospital partners and your emergency management partners, having those technology pathways and those pre-existing relationships is so vitally important. It's hard to do anything when you're working in a silo yeah. um, and building, you know, breaking down those walls and making those communication points and then having technology to communicate with them is so vitally important. Sure. Well, that's a, that's a great segue. And, and uh, if you guys don't mind, my favorite, one of my favorite parts of these is to do the Q and A. I, yeah. I like listening, yeah, sure. you know, uh, reaching out and, and getting some questions from the audience. And uh, we actually have one here, um, Eric. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, can't tell where Eric's from, but uh, Eric has a question that says, uh, how did MCHD with Pulsera gain collaboration with hospitals, et cetera, uh, how long did the process take, and what was key to gaining buy-in? Yeah. Eric, that's a that's a great question. Uh, the hospitals are actually the ones that uh, they're the ones that bring in Pulsera. They're the ones that purchase it, and then we just kind of you know where you know EMS is an add-on. So how it started is you know I think one thing is is you got to communicate frequently. And you got to measure things. That's how we did it. We communicated with our hospital partners every week, and we communicated uh, through email or Zoom to our employees. And what we did is we actually measured. We took the times that we transported to Memorial Hermann, and we took the times that we used Pulsera, and we come up with a percentage from that. And as long as we maintained 95% or better, we were okay with that because there was going to be some glitches in the technology, like we weren't going to have cell service or something like that. But to get it to work, you have to measure and you have to provide that feedback. And there, there may be, I don't know where Eric's from, and there may be some local laws that, mm -hmm. that go around this. But for us now, any new facility we add on, so like we talked about, use freestandings yeah, and standings. psychiatric facilities, any new destination we're going to add, we implement Pulsera as part of the agreement. Like, yeah, we're happy to bring you guys patients. Uh, here's our communication tool. Because radios are expensive. So having to install a radio system that requires maintenance is a lot of work and just using, you know, just saying, here's how we're going to communicate with you to bring you patients is how we're turning on all of our new facilities today. And we're hoping it's going to help with the, you know, the upside of the house is not 
100% uh, represented in this room. And, and so Chief Shaw would say, turnaround times. You guys talk about turnaround times. <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the big, like the big selling point to our staff was the why. You know, we're going to, you know, we're going to help patients. That's the deal. You know, we're going to decrease these times to definitive care, and they're going to have better outcomes. And you have to keep repeating that because that's the end goal is to have a positive impact on your communities. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, here's another question. Um, uh, it says, people often have a hard time with change, even more so during a crisis. I think we all agree with that. <laughs> yeah. How hard is it to implement this technology during a crisis or, in, or, or a stress event? It's kind of a secret. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll say one thing about MCHT is that we uh, – we have a culture where we accept change, especially if it comes from the clinical department. Uh, we're always trying to evolve to get better. So we had that groundwork uh, already there. And I think the why I'd explain to do, you know, we're going to pop, you know, you know, we're going to have a positive impact on our communities, that why. And you just have to measure and you have to provide feedback to all stakeholders involved. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say mm -hmm. it's probably that change i think is very real that that you're uh, talking about there in that question it's yeah. it's that resistance to change i see more of that chief in hospital systems than i do in our profession and in ems as a whole whether it's mchd or another yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean just just explaining to them you know instead of you you know you relying on you're going to call your your radio report to the nurse and hopefully she's got the time to go in and relay all, all that message or you can just suppress a one button you can you know you can let the host STEMI team know you know along with an EKG hey we're headed your way let's meet the cath lab yeah and I would just echo mm -hmm. the there's a lot of type A personalities in this profession so the why is super important so if you mm -hmm. can if you can explain the why and the why makes sense I think that's how you get by it yeah, I have to. I have to give one county hospital story that you know. I, I work in a level one trauma center in downtown Houston, and it, there's nothing more frustrating to every provider, and that will get that gets buy into the hospital side where you call a, a code, which we call a code one there, but essentially a, a trauma activation, and then you'll have all these uh, expensive resources tied up, standing in the shock room, waiting for the patient to come in, and waiting, and waiting and waiting, right? And with no kind of information, no updates, no, uh, you know, some ETA that was, well, it was 10 minutes, 30 minutes ago. Yeah. So I think that that really kind of, if you if you show the benefit there, like I would love to, to be standing there, and actually we do use pagers there, um, <laughs> but to be standing there and have an update, right? The EMS is here, here's the update. Here's actually a picture from the scene. Some some type of, of actionable information. It's, it, it's super frustrating in some of these systems, these big systems. So I think that's one of the ways is that you show the, the benefit that way. And ultimately, as Chief said, the benefit to patients. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's, that's great information. Here's a great question from Alan. Uh, Alan writes in and uh, says, in order to use non-hospital destinations, did you have to get any regulations changed on a state level? So maybe along the lines of the alternative destinations, things like that? Yeah, I, I can take that one. Okay. So, uh, luckily, we live in the great state of Texas, which is a, a delegated practice state, and the state kind of takes a hands-off approach for the most part and leaves those decisions to the medical director. So uh, as long as we have approval from our medical director, we don't have to make any statewide changes to add those alternate destinations. Um, so. And I know it varies state to state. I used to work in North Carolina, which was not a delegated state. And those things would have to go through uh, the Office of EMS or through the Department of Health, Health and Human Services. But uh, I think you have to check with your state regulations uh, and whether you're a delegated state or not. And uh, I think that will vary state to state. Perfect. We got one more in here. Um, it says, uh, uh, yes, uh, sorry, this is Eric. Uh, Eric says, uh, yes, with technology being so important and an increased use, have you seen a decrease in effective skills? In other words, uh, using uh, more technology, uh, are we seeing a decrease in, in our, our, our medics, uh, make either decision-making or, or things like that in the field and, and standing on their own? Or do you feel like they, they, they use the resource as a resource of either I'm stuck, I need help, or 
or uh, help me make uh, better decisions. And I hope I'm, I hope I'm not. Yeah, missing, uh, I, mean, no, <laughs> I would say like we've adopted it well, and uh, I don't think it's hindered in any ways. I mean, it's just helped. It's a, it's a share of information. And uh, I know there's times the more information I could get. I mean, I hit up doc one, one uh, morning on an elderly patient, you know, and, you know, he was able to provide some advice. So I, you know, I don't, yeah. I feel like it probably increases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how has the user experience been with this? Any takeaways to help with adoption and, and success? Yeah, I'll just repeat again. You got to tell them the why. You got to measure the whole time. You got to provide the feedback and keep on measuring because no one cares unless you measure something. I mean, I feel that's just in general. Uh, so, yeah, just keep providing that feedback. Uh, it's going to take some time, especially when you have a lot of stakeholders. Uh, a lot of times, uh, what I found is that we rolled it out in sections. You know, we said, okay, we're going to start with STEMI, then we're going to go to stroke, and then we're going to go to trauma. We didn't try to do it all at once uh, because there are a bunch of hospital partners, especially uh, the different docs that practice, you know, different practices, getting them involved. So that would be my advice on, you know, in, in, uh, in implementation. Yeah. I would agree, Chief. I think that one of the things that gets the docs bought in is that we tried to do before we had the mm -hmm. platform is we tried to, to build lines of communication between our our uh, agency and the subspecialists that we were referring patients through through the ED, mm -hmm. right? Ultimately, they end up in the neurosurgical service, so the neurology service, and we went out and met those doctors, engaged them, uh, and had them come to CE and meet the crews and and get to know one another face to face. Mm -hmm. Like they, believe it or not, guys, they, they, yeah. most doctors in the hospital have no idea what you do for a living. Yeah. They have no idea the kind of environments that EMS operates in and, and kind of how the whole system operates. So it's, I think it's really eye opening for both sides. Um, and ultimately, hospitals are, I'll tell you the dirty secret, right? They are in the business of making money. And hospital CEOs do want those STEMI patients. They do want those stroke patients. And there's a reason that they're building one level one trauma center next to another one. They want those patients too. Sure. And from an administrator's end, I mean, if you're adding uh, facilities, especially at the freestanding where it's just one ER, I mean, there's no more cost effective way to do it than through the Pulsera app. Absolutely. So you guys, and we this this brings the whole conversation here has been talking about uh, the scalability of of the platform and, and the communication. And so you guys talk about the Pulsar being scalable. Uh, does it require extra resources or training to scale this up and down as you need it? Have you did you find that as a barrier to to, to in, in uh, implementing it? You know, chiefs, can you guys just describe? Just talk about uh, the last hospital that you added. So we added a. a, a independent freestanding emergency department to take our patients. Talk about the implementation and what you, how you guys did it and what was involved in it. I think that's kind of the best way to answer the question. Oh, yeah, it was pretty effortless on our end, to be honest with you. I mean, we were basically, I called Josh and I said, Josh, can you add uh, this ED as a destination? We have quarterly CE here. We were able to bring that uh, that those providers in. They had a quick presentation to our crews. We said, hey, you know, now on the destination tab of your pulse area, you can choose this ER. I mean, it was as simple and as seamless as that. And I think what was really good about it is that now I can look and if there's an issue or something comes up, I can look and say, okay, we did take this patient there. And it's 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 an easier avenue for me to do it that way than actually search it to the PCR or through the cat. Yeah, and so like when you look at our disaster response and the pulse area patient and adding our chiefs as destinations, those were all pretty easy changes. And to pulse air's credit, um, you guys were Johnny on the spot at evolving the product and making changes based off the needs of the user. So uh, I would say all of those changes were relatively simple for us to do. Um, it was very scalable for each different thing that we encountered. Yeah. It was easy to make those changes happen. So. Yeah, and so the app is super intuitive. I mean, it's easy to figure out. I, I mean, you can't, I mean, once you get one or two things down, you have it. Pulsera, I mean, they offer... The training platform, uh, when, when we trained was during COVID uh, in the very beginning, and all that training was done through the Pulsera website. So, I mean, as far as implementation, as far as on the training end, really simple. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, guys, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, absolutely uh, a fantastic time with you guys today. Um, 
we really appreciate the big group meeting. Thanks for for, uh, for getting the word out and to uh, to uh, take care of your communities the way you do. So back to you, AJ. Well, thank you. This was great. And on behalf of Gems.com, I'd like to thank uh, all four of you speakers, uh, Jim and Dr. Dixon, Kevin, and Josh did a great job and uh, certainly highlighted the use for uh, for Pulsera. We thank you all for joining us today and look forward to serving you with more webcasts in the future. Have a great and safe day.